Okay. Well, um, I think the room is you know, small enough, participants small enough where we can make it somewhat interactive. If you have questions while we're going along, just raise your hand. Okay. So um, the first thing, I just want to start with a, with a huge thank you for coming. You know, I know it's Friday. It's right before lunch, right? A lot of you guys are probably flying out this afternoon, Mother's Day weekend, right? So thank you so much for coming. I really do appreciate the time. Right. Um, so uh, today's session is going to be about Presto. It is kind of meant to be kind of an introduction to Presto. Um, I'll speak a little bit about uh, IBM. By the way, uh, I'm from IBM, and I'll speak. And those of you, you probably may have heard that uh, we acquired Ahana about a month ago, right, to join uh, the uh, the Presto Foundation. Um, so I'll speak a little bit about that as well, and some of the things that we're thinking about. So there's quite a bit on the agenda today, so I'll try and get through it quickly so we can also kind of have that uh, interactive Q&A. There's also a demo that I want to show you um, in terms of how to get started, what it kind of looks like. Um, uh, but a lot of topics here that we want to cover, so I'll, I'll try and go through it quickly so we can also, again, have time for, for questions as well as maybe in the demo section we can make that live and interactive as well. Okay, but yeah, we'll talk about, you know, what is Presto? Right, you know, you know, why is it interesting? Right, why is it interesting for you? Um, you know, we'll talk about some of the use cases. Right, uh, you know, we'll talk about, uh, um, you know, some of the roadmap as well as what's coming on, as well as uh, we'll finish and close with, uh, you know, uh, the community and how we can all get involved. I think all of you guys are probably more involved than even I am. <laughs> so the first section is about why Presto. Um, what is it in Presto that's kind of interesting? You know, why is it that we're here talking about Presto today? So uh, Presto is a distributed SQL query engine. But interesting enough, that's not really the word that I like to use because everybody claims they're a distributed SQL engine, right? Even the classic originals, Teradata is a distributed SQL engine, right? You know, so is Oracle Rack, you know, so is DB2, um, Netiza. They're all, you know, distributed SQL engines. Um, but Presto is a little bit different, right? Uh, we'll talk some more about some of those differences, but the way I like to talk about Presto is that it has some very different architectural differences compared to traditional warehousing. And we'll go into all those details in the following slides. Um, but I prefer to use the word disaggregated engine, right? Um, that complete independence is, is important. You know, when you get Presto, whether it's open source or whether you get it from a service, it really is just compute. It has also some great capabilities that get into scale and whatnot. Um, to give you a little bit of history, and again, I mean, you guys are all open source guys, right, I think? So um, you probably know this better than I do, but Presto came out of Meta, right? Uh, they contributed over 10 years ago to, uh, to open source, um, but Meta were the same guys who also did uh, Hive, right? Hive SQL for Hadoop, right? So um, Hive for Hadoop had some issues and gaps, certainly for Meta, right? The first issue and gap being is that it wasn't really meant to be ad hoc or interactive. And I'll talk about that in the performance slide also about the difference and why that matters, right? Um, as well as there's other issues as well. Hive SQL is not pure ANSI SQL, right? And SQL basically kind of is the, the language that, that kind of binds it all together, right? So um, Meta, who created Hive SQL, they also then created Presto to be able to address those gaps. And then they uh, released it to the open source community, I think it was um, 2019, over 10 years ago, right? So the interactive nature of it, extremely important. Right. Um, you know, again, I'll talk a little bit more about the performance of why you can actually get that type of interactive ad hoc SQL workload capabilities, um, as well as, you know, um, you know, from from my perspective, when I kind of look at Presto, I was talking to this gentleman in the back about that as well. I, I see Presto kind of hitting in two different directions. There's the virtualization perspective through all of its connectors, right, over 30. Right? And then there's kind of this lake house, you know, again, the interactive ad hoc SQL type of perspective. Right? Um, but it's designed to be both. So you, know, you can see those bullets here. And again, it's designed to access petabytes of data. You know, um, you know Meta, I think there are, there are over 300 petabytes now. So we're talking about data volumes that are very, very, very different. It needed a new solution to be able to access that huge amount of data. Right? Um, you know, they have you know, 1,000 active concurrent users every day, right? And look at like Uber, who also is a very big Presto user, right? And, and they're running 100 million, you know, uh, ad hoc interactive queries every day, right? So it's at a different scale, different scale of volume, different scale uh, that, that, uh, that needed something different and new than, than the traditional warehousing or uh, other type of engines. So with that said, I just want to run through real quick kind of like what kind of like a, a flow would look like. So this is Presto and Orange in the middle. Up in the top, the JDBC layer, you can certainly connect you know, traditional BI applications, be it like MicroStrategy, you know, be it like Tableau, right? Um, 
you know, Excel, right? All that you can certainly do, JDBC, connect to Presto, right? You can certainly also um, uh, satisfy uh, data science type well, use cases. I'll go into that a little bit further as well with things like Jupyter Notebooks, you know, Notebook Access as well. Um, you can use like your open source, you know, SQL editor visualization tool like Superset if you want, right? So standard JDBC connectivity, connect to Presto. Um, on the bottom, the source of your data, again, that's kind of where it's a bit different compared to like traditional, you know, data management systems. Um, certainly connectors to give you all kinds of access, object storage itself, right? Uh, I'll talk more, I'll go deeper into that, but also uh, a lot of data sources, right? From traditional, you know, relational services like, you know, SQL Server, you know, MySQL, Postgres, very big, right? Um, as well as things like, uh, you, know, um, you know, key value stores, right? Like Redis, as well as like streaming, you know, capabilities, Kafka, right? Druid, right? So extremely rich source, right? Um, extremely rich to be able to access that data in place, right? You don't have to really load or migrate it. I'll talk about why that's really cool to be able to immediately access that. So um, I already kind of spoke a little bit about that. Is Presto a database? Uh, I notice there's lots of material that out there that says, well, the main reason why Presto is not a database is because it doesn't come with storage, right? You guys might have heard that. But that's not really necessarily the way that I would see it either, right? You know, those of you who work with traditional type of databases, and, and by the way, um, uh, I've spent my entire career in data management databases, right? Um, work with Teradata, Oracle, you know, Informix, C, you know, DB2, and just all of them, right? Certified in almost all of them, right? And all of them, you can just install the engine, right? You can just point them to generic storage, right? But the real difference is, is that, again, the way Presto does it is very different, the disaggregated nature. All these other databases that I talked about, they tend to have a proprietary internal format, data format. They do it for performance. They do it for security. They do it for lots of reasons. That's kind of the heritage of where they come from. They tend to have an internal technical metadata catalog, right? Different. So there's certain technologies that are different, but starting kind of from the beginning, that scalable, SQL, you know, distributed access, similar in many ways too, right? But again, kind of trying to address a different data set there where others kind of were different. Like if we talk about data warehousing, um, data warehousing, the easiest way that I like to kind of talk about the difference between data warehousing and let's say like Lakehouse, data warehouses can work in the terabytes data range, right? You'll see very few data warehouses that play in the petabyte space. It didn't come out of that big data intent, you know, that Hadoop origin, right? Which now has, has evolved to much better, to Presto and, and to others, right? Um, where of course the, the big you know, like Presto type services, right? Like I talked about before, Meta, right? 300 petabytes, just enormous. And they're accessing and processing through petabytes every day, right? So that's one of the big differences I'd say. What they do, how they do it is different, but in many ways, the purpose that they're trying to serve is similar, right? SQL access to your data. How's it related to Hadoop? <clears throat> I already spoke a little bit about that. You know, Meta came out with, with Hive uh, for Hadoop, um, but Hadoop is, is different. There's performance differences as well. I'll talk a little bit about that, push versus pull, why you get performance you know, improvements with Presto, how things have evolved, right? Um, so related to Hadoop, in fact, one of the most common use cases that we see for Presto is you know, Hive uh, metadata, right? Accessing object storage or even accessing Hadoop directly, right, through a Hive connector. So that, that Hadoop modernization, the relationship with Hadoop, accessing Hadoop data, maybe even modernizing using Hive metadata to be able to access object storage data in some of these more new advanced file formats and table formats, it is related. So I would say there's certainly a history, there's certainly a heritage, there's certainly an evolution, right? There is a relationship here. A lot of customers coming from Hadoop, uh, you know, Hadoop source or Hadoop origin, right? Spoke a little bit again about uh, data warehouse already, right? Again, the big difference. Um, they were built and designed at a different time for a different purpose. And although there are some more kind of what I call modern architectures of warehouses that are somewhat similar, Snowflake is kind of similar in the middle, right? But there's still differences. And anyone would suggest that Snowflake is processing, you know, the likes of data like Meta or Uber or Netflix, certainly not, obviously not, right? <clears throat> So again, what are some of the things that make Presto unique? Scalable architecture, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, again, compared to more of the traditional warehouses, you know, like with Presto, uh, and I'll show it to you in, in, in the demo as well, right? You can certainly, you know, scale Presto, add more worker nodes, right? And it's all online, 
right? Um, you know, there's kind of a whole uh, a discovery process. As soon as the coordinator sees the new workers that you want, you know, that, that's calling out to register, the next query will use them. It'll schedule them and use them. Similar with uh, queries that drop out, right? Queries drop out through failure or whatnot. Um, next query will use the, the new cluster topology. So highly scalable, right? All online, extremely easy, right? Um, thousand nodes, you know, meta is thousand nodes, right? To be able to work with their massive amounts of data, right? Um, pluggable connectors, again, um, this gives you, and, and that's kind of the difference in concept with Presto. In so many ways, it, Presto was designed where here is your engine, we recognize your data is in this way, in these formats, in these locations, in these sources, right? And we will give you a way to be able to access them. So pluggable connectors, right? Uh, extensible connectors. connectors. Um, like for example, at IBM, you know, just recently um, as a part of our project, I'll speak a little bit more about uh, Watson X data. We created uh, connectors for some of our data management uh, engines like DB2 and Netiza. Very easy to do. Whole rich world out there with lots of connectors, again, giving you the ability to connect to just all kinds of different data sources, right? And then to be able to query across them. So you can certainly join across these different connectors and these different data sets, and you can certainly process data across them. So very good uh, virtualization type of capabilities, as well as the performance of Presto. Very good, again, intended, designed specifically for these very, very large data sets. <clears throat> so in the scalable architecture with Presto, um, the easiest, most simple way is kind of this diagram here you see on the right, right? So it's, there's basically two different, you know, node types or roles or pod types if you're deploying this in like Kubernetes. It's coordinator and worker, right? And like I said, you can just add workers, you can drop workers, right? Next query sees them, right? Uh, the coordinator will then, you know, plan and schedule to the new, you know, new, new set. So um, very, very, you know, simple, very, very easy. Right. Um, I'll show you a, a demo where, again, you can use like a same common Docker container. You know, you, you just change the configuration. Basically, say this is you know a coordinator. These are workers that basically point to the discovery service. Extremely easy in those two different node types to be able to handle what's going on. Right. Um, again, very very scalable. Up to thousand workers. Right. Validated the largest companies. I've already kind of given you guys examples of that. Right. And here, just a little bit more kind of going into what's happening. So over starting at the top left, um, you know, this you'll see typical you know, applications that connect into Presto, right? They're typically using JDBC, submitting SQL to Presto, getting results back. Inside the Presto coordinator, um, there's certainly a parser where we take that SQL, right? And then we create a plan inside the coordinator. Those of you who are familiar with databases, they're like SQL access plans, right? I'll give you some examples of what that looks like. I've got the plan, then it's actually scheduled out to the worker nodes, right, in terms of tasks, right? Um, I'll show you again kind of what that looks like. Uh, and typically, there's other information that the coordinator will interact with, and actually all the nodes interact with, which is like metadata, right? So like if you use Hive, again, I'll go into a little bit more detail with that. That Hive connector is, is, is set up on all your nodes, right? So they can all see, you know, things like, you know, what is the table name? What are the columns in the table, right? As well as things like, you know, where is the data file located? That's technical metadata, right? Um, so the way that it flows again, right? SQL plan, scheduled to the workers. Workers are all doing their data, right? From performance perspective, from the workers, um, you know, uh, very, very good parallel execution, right? Down into the uh, push model, much better than like, uh, for example, MapReduce and Hadoop where you're pulling data, processing your, your reduction, sending it back out to disk, then the next stage, you're doing it again, and you're doing it again, right? And so basically, it's kind of like, you know, uh, like a waterfall type of parallelization, which isn't so, so good for interactive, as opposed to uh, Presto, which is very good in that type of, type of uh, uh, capability. So um, I do want to speak a little bit more about connectors. You know, so these are what we call the top five most popular connectors. That Hive connector, extremely popular, either used to connect directly to Hive or Hive Metastores for Hadoop uh, deployments are already there, or used to be able to create Hive tables you know, uh, you know, that you want to work with that's residing in object storage. Now, if you look at this list of the top five, what you'll see is that four of them are related to table formats, right? Hive tables, Delta Lake tables, Iceberg tables, tables, right? So four of them is about table format 
what you need to do, because these table formats offer different capabilities. That's a whole different session of its own. Um, and then one of them has to do with Postgres, which is a database connector. You know, Postgres, awesome open source database, right? Extremely you know, popular, you know, probably one of the more advanced uh, open source uh, you know, uh, uh, database engines, right? So um, that's kind of what you see. Customers are using these connectors, right, to be able to access data in the format that they want. They kind of have different pros and cons for what they're doing, right? You know, Iceberg, very, very popular. You know, um, for example, at Netflix, right, uh, they needed to use Iceberg just because of the time it took to be able to even parse the, the hundreds of thousands of files that were out there just to be able to actually even get a query plan used to take them you know, hours, right? With Iceberg, as well as with uh, some of the performance optimizations that are there, you know, they were taking queries that would take days, and now they were running just in minutes, right? So um, they're all using different table types to be able to do kind of what they're doing. Here at IBM, I'll talk a little bit more about it. We're kind of uh, focused in, in developing, improving, enhancing Iceberg Connector, right? So that's one of the areas that uh, I'll talk a little bit more about when we get to kind of what the future section. Um, and this, this is what they call, so the slide says connector data model. What I like to call it is kind of, um, kind of like a, a naming strategy. Like, so for those of us who are familiar with databases, right, you connect to a database, and then there's typically like these different levels for how you access, you know, your tables, right? There's your database, there'll be a schema, right? Um, there'll be your tables, right? And this is kind of what this is. So in the Presto model, there'll be a connector, and in the connector, you know, that's where you kind of choose, you know, you know what type of data you're going after. Um, it could be virtualized. It could be, again, all those SQL database sources. It could be streaming services, or it could be, you know, a Hive, or it could be object storage, right? So you create this connector, and then that connector will show in Presto as a catalog, right? And again, I'll kind of show you a quick demo of this um, once we get there. And so the naming scheme will be like the catalog, and then the next name tier would be the schema, and then your tables. Right, um, so that's kind of how that works together. Again, connector kind of is the catalog, right? It shows up as a catalog, um, so you choose to enter that catalog. Think of it kind of like a database in the in the traditional space, right? Um, then you create schemas in there for uh, you know for that naming strategy and then tables. Um, so for this next slide for the Hive connector, I kind of want to walk through kind of more what that looks like. So. Uh, in this model, it shows that there's the coordinator, but actually when you configure this, all the workers also have the connector property file for that Hive Metastore, right? So when you're working with the Hive connector and your goal is to be able to access Hive data, whether it's on HDFS or whether it's on object storage, right? So as a part of that connector that we just talked about, you would configure your Hive Metastore, right? You'd say, yeah, I'm using this Hive Metastore. This is where it's at, right? Um, to identify where it's at, it uses thrift, like a thrift URL. Right, um, and then that meta store tells you all the technical details to be able to get to your data. Right, so again, you know it'll be like the table names, the 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 schema of the tables, all the columns in the tables. Right, where it's located. Right, whether it's in S3 or whether it's at HDFS. Right, so it tells you everything you need to be able to understand where you go to get to the data. Right, and so you know, uh, very very common. Like I said, it's probably the most common use of Presto using the Hive connector. Right, to be able to access object storage, um, as well as other you know, HDFS and whatnot. And one of the reasons why this is also popular, and again, this comes from a very rich heritage, right, from that Hadoop Hive heritage. So from the file formats, open file formats, right, um, the Hive table and the Hive connector supports pretty much all of them. Right? And you've probably heard some of these, right? ORC, Parquet. Um, these days, uh, at least at IBM, we, we like Parquet. Right? It's very good for analytics. Um, very good for compression, right? Avro, right? Um, you know, kind of very good more for uh, things like row level transactional, right? Um, but we'll support basically all the types of file formats that are out there, right? Uh, against a Hive connector, if you're doing this like on object storage, you know, these are basically Hive tables, right? So the table format is Hive, and then the file format can be any of these, right? The last line there, the no data ingestion needed, I touched a little bit on that. So the idea is, is that if you're using the Hive connector and you know where your data is, Right, so let's say I know that my data is on AWS S3, right? I know it happens to be, let's say, in Parquet, right? Then what you can do with the Hive connector is that you then just point to that, you know, to those assets, right? So you say, yeah, I know my data file is there. Right? I know it's Parquet. You create a Hive table on top of it, so then it shows up in that naming space, right? It'll be through the Hive connector, 
um, you know, uh, which shows up as a catalog, right? Schema you create, table you create, and then you can immediately SQL access all that data in place. Right? You don't have to, there's not this concept of I need to you know, load it. There's not this concept of you know, I need to ingest it. Right? So it's meant to be in place. But one of the questions that I know that, uh, that, this, that this gentleman up here asked was, but you know, if I'm looking for performance, is that necessarily what I'll do? So you can get this instant access, no data ingest needed. But if you want performance, then yeah, a lot of it has to do with optimizing things like the file format. Right. Okay, now um, since we're talking about connectors, uh, we do want to talk a little bit about some of the connectors you know, and the progress that's happening. So there's always you know, you know, lots of connector development. I talked about how from IBM we're certainly looking at, or we, we've already created DB2 and Atiza. Um, but there are also you know, other work that's happening certainly throughout the open source community. Um, there is a native Delta Lake connector that's already there. Right now it's read only, but soon write support for it will be coming. Lark Sheets connector is also there, right? Some of the areas that we're working on, right? Uh, we want the Hootie connector to be native faster. That's really kind of the purpose of it, right? As opposed to going through like, like a Hive Metastore, right? Uh, same with the Iceberg connector. The current Iceberg connector in Presto is, you know, doesn't support deleting rows, right? You can certainly insert, right? Um, there's also other areas of table maintenance, things like, um, you know, expiring snapshots, right? Um, you know, other areas, things like that as well, compaction, whatnot, um, that, uh, that we also want to bring in. So, so some of those things will also be coming as well as performance improvements, right? DML performance improvement is also one of the big areas that I know that uh, IBM is certainly looking at and trying to contribute for open source. Okay, and uh, in terms of why is it that Presto's performance is very good in this space, because I was speaking about that throughout pretty much all these slides, um, part, first part of it is the in-memory processing. So um, kind of coming, when you think about where it came from, right, this is the Hadoop Hive. Hadoop Hive is really, really good at high bandwidth, but its latency is really, really poor. And I kind of talked a little bit about that. So Hive SQL with MapReduce is what you call a pull model. Right, um, so it's that same notion, right? You bring all the, you you read all the data, you you reduce it, and you write it back out, and it's like this waterfall model, right? That's very serialized, right? Uh, with Presto, it's very much a push model, right? We actually push all the execution down into all the workers, all the tasks, and the workers can even communicate with each other. So there's none of this waiting for the stage up above for it to finish, right? Um, so the architecture is very different, right? Uh, designed for much better latency, right? Where again, I'd say Hive kind of came from a very high bandwidth you know, uh, intent and design, right? Um, out of the box, it's all in memory. There are some experimental capabilities to be able to spill, but that's really not the way most people run Presto. So when we're looking at uh, a lot of our customers, a lot of our HANA customers, um, they don't run with spill enable. It's an experimental capability, right? They run in intended in memory, right? So that means everything's happening in memory. Again, how you get the faster, um, the faster latency, right, um, for that interactive ad hoc query style. In terms of columnar storage and execution, certainly Presto is a columnar engine, right? So it favors, you know, again things like you know Parquet columnar file format, right? So in terms of feeding into the engine in column, for, you know, in, in kind of a column method of processing, that basically is the standard, the normal for anything that's really analytic workloads. So basically every you know, reasonably modern engine is, is, column, is a column-oriented engine, right? Um, and one of the other capabilities that's very good, certainly uh, in, in, in the Anhana product, which is coming into the Watson X data product, is this multi-level caching with Raptor X. Um, multi-level, so certainly clearly the data cache is also available, but there's also like metadata cache Right, so like in the Hive example above, when you're constantly talking to that metadata, right, um, you know, show tables, give me a list of all the tables, right? In many of these environments, you can have thousands of tables, right? Do a metadata cache to help speed that up. Header, you know, cache, right? That's kind of like the example I was talking about with Netflix, right? When there's you know, hundreds of thousands of files, right? To be able to go through and process all of them, to be able to optimize and you know, look at the ranges and all the, you know, the metadata of each of the file headers, that's available there as well. Partial result cache, where you can have you know, uh, intermediate results that uh, you can use as well to complete, you know, your query. You know, so uh, multi-tiered caching, um, you know, many use cases, 10x performance improvement, right? So again, all about the latency. So let's improve, you know, in this case, you know, IO latency with multi-tier cache. 
So let me quickly go through kind of like what a life of a query looks like. This is the most simple example. It's basically just select all the rows from an orders table with one filter applied, discount equals zero. So what that looks like in terms of like, you know, the operators, the stages that you'd see, you know, this kind of again looks kind of like an explain plan. If you use the, uh, the Presto monitoring you know, uh, UI, you, know, you can look at the explain plan. It looks kind of like this, a little bit like this on the right. So very simple, right? You start with scan of the table. You apply the actual filter, right? Only, I only want the rows with discount equals zero, and then you produce the result, right? For something that's a little bit more complicated, complicated just from the perspective of we kind of want to touch all those common operators that you actually use, right, inside, you know, uh, analytic type queries, right? So in here, you'll see that, well, we add a sum. Right? We also add a second table that we want to join with. Right? We also add a group by. Right? So similar type of thing that you'd look like. So in the actual operator, all right, um, in the actual explain plan of how this is actually processed. So you would start, and generally you kind of want the large table on the left. So you scan that large line item table. Right? You apply that filter, that predicate with discount equals zero. Right? You join it with the orders table on the common order key. Right? And then from there, you flow it up and you apply the aggregations. You, know, you do the sum on the columns and the group rise. Okay, so the next I want to go through is I do want to go through uh, Presto use cases. You've been hearing me talking about interactive. So yeah, lots of reporting, lots of dashboarding, right? Um, but there's also things like data science use cases, right? Because the data scientists also kind of often want to access a lot of data, particularly if they're coming from that Hadoop type of origin. Right, as well as again the federating query across data sources. So, you know, if you look at kind of like that flow, like we started with, you know, what does it look like when you're talking about reporting and dashboarding? Right. So, you know, again, you'll see typical BI reporting tools, you know, on the top in this example. So things like Tableau or Looker, right? JDBC uh, driver to connect to the Presto cluster. You'll see that uh, in this case on the left, it's going to use you know like a Hive Metastore connector. Right? to be able to access data in S3 data, but it can also access data from MySQL. You can join them together, right? send your data up to Tableau. Similarly on the right, you can use Looker you know, uh, as your BI reporting tool. In this particular case, we're not using the Hive, well, we're, we're not using the Hive Metastore. We're using the Glue Metastore instead that's available as the, uh, in AWS and accessing S3 to be able to get that data and send the results up, up to Looker. Okay, and the data science case, similar again. So from the data science case in this, in this example, you know, they're hitting the same data sources, right? But they're using different tools to be able to access that data, right? So data science, you know, very common that they're using notebooks. So certainly Jupyter notebooks are there, um, but also, you know, all the other typical type of data science you know, notebook applications. You can certainly connect to Presto, access all the data sources that you're interested in. Um, you know, if you're interested in creating new, you know, training models and you have data from, from all kinds of virtualized sources, you can do that as well with all those different connectors that are available, as well as access, you know, the petabytes of data that might be in your data lake, your object storage, which is typically where they reside. Okay, now uh, Presto can also do batch type of work and certainly in uh, Meta that is the case. And uh, the typical type of batch is typically around transformation, right? You know, you might hear it as ETL or ELT, right? Um, and it certainly works fine with uh, common tools like Airflow, right? To be able to help you with that type of, you know, uh, data, you know, transformation, data movement, right? And you can certainly use the Presto cluster to be able to help with that as well. Right, um, and again, you know, using the rich data source environment that Presto offers, be it connectors to database sources, or be it you know things like object storage sources, like through HMS, um, you can certainly uh, to access that as well and run batch jobs. Okay, so um, you've heard me talk a lot about uh, this uh, data lake house, open data lake house. So I, I kind of wanted to share with you what this might look like. So what would a data lake house you know, with Presto look like? You see Presto here in the middle. Um, right now, in almost all the customers, every customer I speak to, you'll see the data warehouse and lake house is usually side by side, right? Um, you know, I was just speaking to a customer um, just before I came here, and they happened to be a Snowflake customer, right? But they didn't want to use Snowflake, which was also very expensive, to be able to do that ETL batch type of job. Right, that I just talked about. They wanted to use Presto to do that, right? Um, 
I know in the slide I talked about performance up above, but in many cases it's also about price performance, right? Because Presto offers just excellent price performance, certainly compared to the likes of like, you know, more traditional data warehousing, right? So this particular customer, you know, they wanted to do a lot of the uh, ETL work. They wanted to write it out to an open iceberg table format, and then they were using Snowflake external tables to then read those tables for any of the reporting that they wanted to do, right? So, you know, many places you'll see this together, right? For the highest levels of reporting and dashboarding, you know, something that uh, they might come from, or if it's just even heritage of data warehouses that they already have, a lot of times that's there, then they'll be bringing in things like Presto or the Open Lake House to be able to get access to things like the open formats. Because remember what I was talking about, the differences between like traditional, you know, data warehouses and this new Presto or Open Lake House, the big difference was the was not the storage. So even in this slide here, it says proprietary storage. It's proprietary data format. Like for the Snowflake example I just talked about, the customer that I just spoke to, right? Snowflake writes in its own internal proprietary data format. It happens to go to object storage, same object storage that like, for example, Presto would use in a similar type of scenario, right? Um, but a lot of customers want to be able to move to an open file format that multiple, many applications can access. So they want to use Parquet or they want to use ORC, right? Um, they want to use, you know, uh, open file formats and they want to use open table formats. They want to use Iceberg. They want to use Delta Lake. They want to use Hootie, right? So you'll see a lot of this kind of coming together and this is kind of what the architecture looks like. And then the last thing I want to talk about and just kind of show you real quick is an introduction before I jump into a demo. Let me check time real quick. Good, I think we have a good time. So earlier this week, uh, IBM announced uh, what they call WatsonX.data, right? And this is um, IBM's entry into that open data lake house, right? Um, and the key differences in terms of, you know, our customers, what they were telling us, right? What are some of the pain points? What is it that we could do? I don't know if you can kind of see that very clearly, but I'll show you in a demo and kind of highlight what it is. So over on the left, one of the areas that they were really interested in was the ability to kind of bring this together. You heard me speak about how you can have all these different connectors to be able to point to all these different data sources, right? To be able to point to different, you know, uh, technical metadata stores, to be able to point to different storage pieces where, again, all these open file and table formats might reside. To be able to do that, a lot of our customers still found it a little gorpy, right? There's all these different configuration property files that you have to set up. You have to set it up on every node. So one of the things that we've done, like with Watson X Data, is that um, we make it really easy. Right, you register your object storage, right? You register, you know, your high meta store if there is one, right? And you kind of can just kind of like, you know, puzzle piece, glue them together, and we'll create all those property files for you underneath, right? Making it extremely much easier to be able to set up your, your diverse environment, right? So to be able to connect to all these different sources, one of, that's one of the big differences. Um, over on the right, I want to talk about this a little bit to be able to share all of that. Again, I don't know if you can actually see this, but, uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you more in the demo, but what you'll see is that on the top level are all the engines. One of the things that, that, that we believe is very valuable in this space, when you're in, working with all these different files, data formats, file formats, different data engines, at the end, you want to be able to share them, right? So, you know, you heard me speak about how like Iceberg is a strategy for us. Right? So the idea is, is that, okay, well, if you want to agree on, let's say, an iceberg table format, let's, and, and that will provide you some level of consistency, you should be able to share that across multiple engines and then benefit from the efficiencies of those engines that are, again, designed to do different things. So up on the top, you know, there's Presto here, right? There's you know, uh, Spark next to it. There is Netiza next to it, and there's DB2 next to it. And all of them can share access to this level of uh, catalogs, which are like those technical meta stores, right? Which shows you where all the data is. It gives you all the technical details of where all the data is, and then all the object storage, which is where all that data resides. So all these engines can now share and participate together Right? Iceberg will give you the consistency so one doesn't necessarily step on the other and they're all seeing the most recent data, right? That they can each change and participate inside you know, uh, this new lake house world, right? So, so um, we're putting the tools together to help build that and make that easier for you. So, so many of our customers, they have different engines, right? And you know, there might be vendors that only have one engine and they say, my one engine can do it all. But I think we all know that that's never true. Right? So our big part of the strategy is to say, no, 
we can make it easy for you so they can all participate. Okay, so with that, let me kind of show you a couple demos real quick. I'm sorry, what was the question? So the question is, is there more than one catalog? And there can be more than one catalog, but where you share would be through a catalog. Like for example, um, when you configure Iceberg or a connector in Presto, uh, you choose where you wanna store what they call the Iceberg catalog, which is the pointer to the most recent version of the data. So uh, a typical you know, um, configuration would be is you would store that Iceberg catalog in Hive Metastore. So then all the engines can go to Hive Metastore, which it is completely consistent and asset comp you know, uh, compliant. So they can go in and then make sure that they're looking at the most current iceberg you know, pointer, um, you know, um, snapshot, right? Um, so then they can all make sure that they're participating and sharing and actually getting the data that's the most recent up to date. Okay, but there could be multiple catalogs that you're sharing as well. Because um, again, the, the metadata is, is the metadata for a particular set of files and data, right? So, you know, you can have iceberg connectors going through four different catalogs for four different departments, finance department, HR department, right? And they can all still share, but they're going through their paths and we're making it easy for you to set that all up. So there could be, yes, there could be, absolutely. And again, it could be, you know, customers kind of organize their data the way that they wish, right? So they might have multiple, yeah, metadata, meta stores to do that, absolutely. Uh, so there's two things I actually want to show you real quick. So the first thing I want to show you is that there's a very, very easy way to get started. Um, you know, Ahana, again, the company that we acquired, they offer a Docker container. It's in the Docker registry, right? So there's a single, it's called, you know, it's a Presto DB Sandbox, right? And so I'm running this on my Docker desktop right here, right? Let me just go ahead and start this coordinator real quick so it gets it starting, right? And, um, you know, same container. You just go and you just configure it differently. You know, I set this up and... 30 minutes, right? So on my laptop, I can run, you know, a Presto cluster, one coordinator, multiple workers, right? Um, as soon as that comes up and running, you'll see this, right? So this is the, the Presto monitoring UI, right? You'll see, and by the way, the way that I set up that coordinator is it's also a worker. I'm sorry, say again? Oh, how do I share that? Yeah, why is that? Let me, let me, let me, thank you. That's a, Thank you for pointing that out. Let me go to here. If I end the slideshow, ah, there you go. I'll jump back to the slideshow as soon as, soon as I get back to it. Sorry about that. So what I was showing is that uh, this is just Docker desktop. Grab the container, right? Same container, right? You configure it as a coordinator, as a worker. I quickly started this coordinator. My coordinator in this case is also a worker. So when you hit the UI, which by the way, you can just, you know, you can get it from here, right? It'll pop up, it'll show up as one worker. Now what I'm gonna do real quick, and this is also kind of what I was talking about before, let me go ahead and just fire up these workers here. All right, so now I'm starting the worker pods, right? And so what you'll see is it'll take a couple seconds, right? And then those worker pods will pop up here and then you'll see them active. As soon as they become active, because again, they're going through a, a discovery service, right? Announcing themselves, hey, I'm a new worker right? Um, please see me. As soon as the coordinator sees it, the active worker pops up. The next query, right, is then properly scheduled, paralyzed, tasked out to those workers, right? And that should come up any moment. There. And so those two other additional workers now pop up as active workers. Again, any query that you submit, we'll use that you know, all online, all very good, extremely, you know, uh, in terms of uh, very easy scalability, what I was talking about before, right? So one of the things I'd recommend, you just go to Google, you can say Ahana Sandbox, you'll see uh, very simple instructions, just a couple handful of steps to be able to do that. You can run this on your laptop, right? You can run it on your Linux server, just to get started, right? It's all free, you know, highly recommend that. Now, I do also want to show you kind of what, uh, what IBM's WatsonX.data is about. At IBM, we're, we're all about security. <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about that too. Well, we're bringing in a lot of improvements in terms of press to security, service to service.
So what I've done here is I've, I've just logged into IBM Cloud. Um, this is particularly a development account, so it's called test.ibm.cloud, right? And so what you can do is that if you just kind of search, like let's say we want to search for Watson X dot data, right? Then you'll see in the catalog, and then you can actually ask for the service. So right now this is in beta, right? It'll GA in July. Right? And so what you can do is that with Watson X data, we allow you to be able to deploy your Presto clusters in IBM Cloud or in AWS Cloud. So you can click on either. And uh, you know, if, like, let's say we want to do AWS, and then you get different regions and different data zones, right? And then what'll happen is, is uh, you'll get an estimate of kind of what that would look like to be able to get started, right? And then all you have to do is, you know, and you can make a couple connection changes, you know, enter your service name if you want a different service name. Uh, pick certain endpoints and requirements if you only want a public endpoint or private or public, right? And then you can go ahead and create that, right? So, um, you know, very easy to do, right? To subscribe, pick the location of your cloud, pick the data center that you want, and you're good to go, right? Now, the next thing that I want to show you is that when you do that, what does that look like, right? So if we come back here, we look at the resource list. I already have a couple that I stood up real quick. So under databases, here you'll see it. So let's go ahead and take a look at like this one, for example. I kind of want to walk you through how easy it is to be able to set this up. And then we'll go into the web console. So when you ask for the service, you'll enter this kind of welcoming screen here, right? And um, it's designed to get you up and running really quick. So in the screenshot I showed you, right, there's kind of these three tier in the infrastructure map that we create for you, and we make it very graphical. So the top are all the engines that you want to provision. On the next tier are the catalogs, the meta store to be able to access your data, and then the bottom is your storage, like typically object storage buckets, right? So we made this extremely easy. Right? Um, we also give you like a provision, our own provision bucket if you want. We'll just go ahead and use that for now. Right? And then you could choose what type of catalogs that you want to create. Right? For beta, you can do an Apache Hive catalog. Again, that's one of the most common ones. Or you can do like an Iceberg catalog. Right? So let's just go ahead and keep both of them on there. And you can see it kind of filling up. Right? So the first choice I made is an IBM provision. You see it on the bottom, catalogs, the next tier. Then you could choose what type of engine that you want to create. Right? Uh, DB2 and the are in this case, Presto. Right? And you could choose you know, what type of compute that you want, compute optimizer, storage optimizer, and then you could see it fill in the production, you know, up in the engine map here. You click next, and then it'll go ahead and provision that for you. All right? So um, yeah, I'll go ahead and provision that, that's fine. And then it takes a few minutes to be able to do that. So the next thing I want to do is I want to kind of show you what it all looks like, and then show you what some of the new capabilities that are there to kind of help make your life easier. So let's go into this one here. This is where we've been doing some of our performance work. So again, we'll just kind of open the console. Right? And so in here, we already have an engine. We already have four catalogs. So if we look at the infrastructure map, right, you could see that we have a Presto engine here. And here we're using multiple catalogs that are available, right? So we have Hive, we have Iceberg, and then we have a couple TPCDS where we've been doing some performance tests. We have multiple buckets here. And then this engine can access all these buckets through all these different metadata services. Right? So some of the other things I just want to point out real quick, yes, we do have an ingestion hub. Right? So if you have data coming from other different locations, you want to be able to move it, you want to be able to automatically create the tables, the metadata for it, this tool will make it really, really easy for you. Right? We also offer things like uh, Data Explorer and a SQL Editor. Right? So what's really kind of cool here about uh, Data Explorer, you can see all the catalogs, right, which are you know, related to the connectors. You can just kind of explore your data here. Very, very easy to do. So for example, you know, um, we have TPCDS here all ready to go. Right? You can take a look at the tables that are there. Right? Um, and then we also have things like SQL Editor. Right? So you can use the, the Data Explorer on the side to be able to see what you're trying to do. So for example, this TPCDS that I was looking at, so you know, the naming scheme I was talking about. So you can say something like, let's use this TPCDS catalog and let's use SF1 schema, right? And then from the SF1 schema, let's say we wanna do a select star from call center. Center, 
And if you go ahead and say, and you can choose to, of course, run it on different engines, but it'll go through. Uh, hmm. I'm not sure why that is giving me a problem. That should be fine. But yeah, you can normally enter your SQL, edit, SQL information there. Um, I think we're almost at time, so let me just hit a couple things real quick before we close, because I think we're right at time, and I think people are already having to go to their next session. Um, so let me go back to this real quick. And talk about some of the future things that we want to get through real quick. Um, Okay, so um, one of the things that you'll also see coming um, to our products is the notion of multiple coordinators, disaggregated coordinators. You'll be able to see a much easier way to be able to get that up saying, you know what I want, you know, multiple coordinators to be able to get high availability there as well. So you'll see that coming. Um, a large part of the optimization, this what we call task bin packing, that's also in progress and that's coming as well. This really kind of has to do with when you parallelize your workload and then you assign it to all the workers, um, you know, typically there'll be, you know, a, a fixed set of resources, right? Most often memory, right? So uh, improvements to be able to parallelize, send out that work to each of the workers. Um, you know, that you'll see improvements there around performance. For efficiency, it'll be more pushed towards native execution. Um, one of that is like Prestissimo, which will be uh, native C++ workers. You'll also see it in the actual connectors, native access to different data sources and connectors. Um, you'll also see things like Aria, Parquet, that's happening. Um, you know, certainly extensions to SQL functions, UDF, uh, external UDF servers, right? Uh, certainly improvements in Apache Ranger as well. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going kind of fast. I think I'm already over by two minutes. Um, other areas I want to talk a little bit about in terms of what is it that IBM is focusing on. We're certainly focused around security. All our customers absolutely need it. So things like, you know, uh, access controls, um, governance, what we call data centered, the ability to look at all your data. Because remember, the engine is completely disaggregated. Any engine can access any data. They can all share. So what's really important is uh, security of the data itself. Right? So to be able to create access controls and policies against data itself and then have that apply regardless to whatever engine is actually trying to access it. Right? So you can provision you know, five, six different engines, but the, the security control is on the actual tables or columns all the way down to whatever granularity you want. Right? And it will be enforced regardless of which engine that you want to access it. Right, um, something that you know is really important to certainly a lot of the finance customers and whatnot. Um, service to service authentication authorization. You saw like in the Lake House architecture diagram that there's lots of different pieces and they all work and communicate with each other. Right, so it's really really important certainly to a lot of the IBM customers that all of it is completely secure, encryption enforced, full authentication, full authorization. Right, so you'll see that from every service to service when you're bringing different engines. You know that'll also be completely secure when you're accessing and sharing different meta stores and whatnot. Another area that's extremely important that IBM has already been contributing, we've already contributed more than uh, a dozen um, you know, uh, you know, check-ins, is for Prestissimo VLOX. So this is for native um, C++ workers. Presto is written in Java. Right? I was speaking to um, you know, this Trino gentleman just a moment ago right? um, about how much of a performance difference that makes. And we're talking like 10x plus. Right, performance profiles look very different because of latency of Java. Right, it's that same latency story. Presto latency much better than Hive Hadoop MapReduce. Right, VLOX latency will be much much faster than that. So in the interactive lakehouse space, massive performance improvement. Um, we hope to be able to get at least some sort of um, beta, if not release, of Prestissimo sometime by the uh, end of this year. Right? And we also want to make sure that the iceberg table format, a um, couple things. First of it, of course, is specification completeness. The current Presto implementation of the iceberg table isn't complete. Um, there's more capabilities we want on there. I mentioned some of the table optimizations, the maintenance I kind of spoke about, as well as just improving the performance, particularly around DML, right? around things like inserts, around things like deletes. Right? Um, this has been a problem even uh, uh, voiced by some of our open source uh, you know, partners. 
okay? And then the last thing I wanna do before I close, and I'm sorry, I know that, again, late in the afternoon, I'm taking out too much of your time. Uh, please do get involved with the Presto community. In fact, this is why IBM was so excited to be able to join this Presto community, right? Uh, we love the governance model. We love the democratization of, of, of you know, of, of how everyone participates and contributes, right? So you can join the Slack channel, right? Uh, please feel free to, you know, join, you know, the whole community, write a blog, right? Contribute to the project itself. You know, one of the things that we're really excited about is the actual community itself grew by over 110% just this past year, right? This is the Presto Foundation community, right? A lot of really exciting things that are happening. I only was able to touch on some of it, you know, in the beginning, right? So please do join. PrestoCon is coming up in June 7th, another place where you can get and learn a lot more about what's going on, right? So I provided this link here about PrestoCon. Please do try and attend if any of this is interesting for you. And again, uh, please do feel free to reach out to the community. It's really a vibrant, exciting community. Thank you so much. Sorry for going over on this last day right before your lunch. Um, are there any other questions? Anything I can help you with? Yes, yes, I will. Yes, I will. Um, and then I think we do need to close, but uh, please do feel free to reach out or, or just walk on up and I'll be able to help you with anything that you, that you ask. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.